previously on your favorite episode. It's actually du hast ein perfekten Zwanz. Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of your favorite episode. I am your host Jackie and joining me is my partner and producer Mickey. Our guest today is Joe Schlapowski, stand-up comedian, horror movie enthusiast, and honestly one of my favorite human beings on the planet. Today we're going deep on Metal Apocalypse Season 3, Episode 9, Death is As. Y'all ready to get into it? Let's go. TV rots your brains. That's absurd. TV only softens the brain like a ripe banana. Television. Much of our future depends on the way we use this medium of communication. I'm just going to start by saying hello to Joe. Hey, what's up, Jackie? What's up, Mickey? Good How's it going, guys. man? It's going good. So, uh, are you getting excited for the uh, upcoming event? <laughs> Uh, which which upcoming event are we referring to? Probably the biggest event of your life. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the wedding, uh, definitely. So we have Joe here with us, and uh, Joe, why don't you tell us? I already told the the audience, so it's fine. But also, you tell them what show you picked, what episodes you picked, and why you picked it. Oh yeah, so I picked uh, the show. I picked was Metalocalypse. One of my favorite all-time uh, Adult Swim animated series. The episode I picked was Death Zaz, which is from season three. Man, it was really hard to choose because I really <laughs> love Metalocalypse a whole lot. It's like one of my favorite things in the world. And it was a toss-up between this one, uh, the episode Death Gov, where Nathan Explosion <laughs> becomes the governor Florida of Florida. One. Yeah. Uh, the Snakes and Barrels episode, where Pickle's old band reunites, and Mother Clock, where Pickle's becomes a realtor. Because his mom changed him, but this one is just—I think it's the most fun episode, and I really love the songs in it. Like the, because uh, if you guys have never seen Metalocalypse before, it's uh, yeah, just kind of show. give them an idea of what the show is. Tell them about yeah. It. So it's an animated Adult Swim series uh, created by Brendan Small, who also did Home Movies. It's about a fictional melodic death metal band called Death Clock that is like the world. They're supposed to be the world's most popular form of entertainment. They're also like its ninth largest economy. So they're like multi-billionaire, <laughs> uh, ultra powerful death metal band. Most of the episodes revolve around the band. This one's kind of an exception. There's a few like uh, the Snakes and Barrels episode also revolves more around that band. But generally, it's whatever the, the premise of the episode is. Something happens and the show usually ends with Death Clock playing a show somewhere, mm -hmm. which always ends disastrously for the audience. Like. <laughs> People are always getting, uh, you know, like. I feel like I've seen so many creative deaths watching the little bit of the show that I have. And it's that part of the kind of delightful because I think how much fun the writers must have in the writer's room, just like coming up with crazy ways to kill the audience. Yeah, that's like it's one of the most fun things about it. Like every episode ends with the audience just being like mutilated, burned, <laughs> you know, chopped in half eaten by carnivorous little cats like it's, it's great like who are the characters in the show your main characters are the the band death clock which is comprised of the vocalist nathan explosion uh who's based on uh what's i like one thing i like about it is they're all based on kind of like real metal musicians mm -hmm. uh so nathan explosion is based on corpse grinder the singer of cannibal corpse and uh Peter Steele from Typo Negative, <laughs> who are both like big, imposing dudes with like super deep voices. Uh, <laughs> I actually saw Cannibal Corpse back in like December or something. They were like one of the best live bands I've ever seen in my life. And nobody, nobody can headbang like the Corpse Grinder. He's got the thickest neck of any human being <laughs> I've ever seen. And he can just whip his head around like so crazy. It's awesome. They're like a uh, typo negative, but they're kind of like a sort of like goth sort of doom metal band from like the 90s to like around 2010 when Peter Steele died. But uh, they're great. They're kind of a guilty pleasure band for me because they're not like, you know, they're not respected by hardcore like metal fans. You know, they're like a little too polished and clean sounding and too many songs about girls and stuff. They're not brutal enough. We should but, listen to them on the way to the open mic tonight. 
Oh yeah, you'll, oh, yeah. I think you'll like them. I, I think the, you'll like the them. description. Sounds right up my alley. I like them a lot. Like they're great, and you know Peter Steele, he's like he's this like huge dude, like six five or something. He has like the deepest like baritone singing voice. Okay, so we have Nathan Explosion, and he's like the head of it. Yeah, he's a, he, so he's the vocalist. Uh, I would say singer, but you know it's death metal vocals. They're not really <laughs> singing. And then you have the drummer Pickles, who originally played in like a glam kind of like hair metal band like called snakes and barrels they're sort of based <laughs> a little bit on like motley crew and some of the old like uh uh guns and roses and those type of bands and then you have the two guitarists uh toki wartooth who's norwegian he and talks, based- i love toki because i think he talks like the way that we make our stuffed animals talk like i have it the same like weird verb now disagreement. Yeah, it's it was very validating to hear the way that Toki talks. Oh yeah, I love it. And him, he and Swisscar, they both like Swisscar is supposed to be Swedish. They both pluralize everything, except for it's weirdly enough when they talk about pickles, they call him pickle. Uh, everything else has an S at the end. Uh, so he's based on kind of like Norwegian black metal uh, musicians, kind of an amalgamation of them. And then Swisscar, he's the Toki's the rhythm guitarist, which comes into play in a lot of episodes. And you have Swisscar, who's the lead guitarist, and he's like, uh, you know, tall, blonde, like Swedish melodic death metal guy based on. Actually, I'm seeing a band called At the Gates tonight, which is like kind of the one of the bands that sort of kicked off the Swedish melodic death metal scene in the 90s. And then there's Murderface, the bass player, who is. The most unlikable, annoying character, like talks with a horrible lisp, has bad taste, wears combat boots and basketball shorts, and has a terrible haircut. His um, head looks like Man of War from He Man <laughs> Masters of the Universe cartoon. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to place it, and that is it exactly. Mm-hmm. He looks kind of like the new Gomez Adams head shape. Ooh, it's so fainty. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I, mean, I think Luis Guzman is going to kill it. But his head is weird shaped. He's quite as like tall and handsome as Raul Julia. No. <laughs> no. But if you've uh, looked at the Adams Family comics at all, it's very like almost spot on the Luis Guzman version. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't think I've ever seen the comics. Like hair, you like just look up a picture of the comics and you'd be like, oh yeah, they nailed it. Like the hair, mm-hmm. everything is great. Well, that's cool. I didn't know that, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. That's like uh, I love the old Adams Family. Mm-hmm. Me too. Yeah. Okay, so that's like the main characters. So that's the, the yeah, that's the band. Then the other probably other most prominent character is their manager, Charles <laughs> Foster Oftenson, who's like, you know, he's their manager, business manager, PR person. Like he kind of manages the whole Death Clock Empire. And you know, they have like their own like giant house and their own sort of like little like sovereign city state. It's called like Mord House, <laughs> where they all live. And he runs that whole thing. And then in this episode, we have uh, Dr. Roxo and his band Zaz Blammy with Taz. Who are... <laughs> the names of everything in the show are delightful. It's great. Like uh, They're based on, on Van Halen. It's like Van Halen with kiss makeup, basically, is what you get. Like, is that, is that Mickey, Mickey, called, Mickey said they, that they were Van Halen. I was like, no, nah, that looks like kiss. So yeah, it's we like, both no. got it. Yeah, it's a little of both. Like, uh, Dr. Roxo is definitely based on David Lee Roth. Yeah, there's one picture of them. There's a scene in this episode uh, where there's kind of like a montage of uh, Zaz Blaming Mataz. And <laughs> there's they're coming out of the uh, uh, airplane, and they all just kind of all four lined up. And you take a snapshot of that. And if you took that side by side with a snapshot of Van Halen, it's very definitive that they the whoever drew them took that picture uh from van halen and and just modeled the modeled the band yeah it's like that like late 70s early 80s van halen definitely uh which you know brendan small he like is a huge van halen fan too so i think that's a big part of it during that montage you can see the the zaz blammy mataz uh logo and it's very wink wink nudge nudge hey that's a van halen logo uh thing yeah, they're uh, they're definitely Van Halen based. And the, I, this is the only one you really see the whole band. Because mm-hmm. uh, Doctor Roxo, he's like a recurring character throughout the whole uh, series. Yeah, whoever did the voice of uh, Roxo, I pretty much nailed uh, that the David Lee Roth style uh, of it, and even like all the. Mu- I know Brendan did most of the music uh, for the show, and he he pretty much nailed Van Halen's 
uh, aura, I guess. Uh, it's not yeah. like exactly, hey, this is a Van Halen song that we ripped off, but it's a, uh, a tribute to uh, a Van Halen type song from that era of the early, early days of David Lee Roth. Yeah, like he, it, it really is like it nails their style. And there's a few different like Zaz Blammy Mataz songs that you hear and they all sound like early Van Halen songs, like the the good Van Halen in my opinion. <laughs> Brennan Small, he's amazing. Like he went to Berkeley, so he, you know, he is a very accomplished musician. Like he, you know, he got me real into playing lead guitar. You know, like I always played music, but like after getting real into Metalocalypse, and I really wanted to learn how to like shred. <laughs> My favorite episode of Home Movies is the one that focused on on music with the little the dude with the hair covering his eyes, where they they formed the band and they played Freaky Outy. One of the very first MP3s Mickey got for me when we were like friends before we even started dating. He like, he sent me the MP3 of Freaky Audi and it made me very happy. Freaky Audi! Stop! Stop! We're stop! Oh, that's awesome. I haven't, like, I haven't watched enough home movies yet. Like, I actually, I didn't even see it when it was on. I only ever watched it in like the last year or so. I was obsessed with it when it was on. Yeah, it's like, I saw the what the little bit that I saw was great, you know, like, uh having h john benjamin so good you know brendan small like and that's the other thing about like metal metalocalypse i think it's like it's such a funny show you wouldn't expect being a show about like a death metal band yeah i want to ask you like when you watched this episode for the first time like where were you and all of that like like was it recent was it a long ass time ago like that kind of stuff i think i this one probably the first time i saw it would have been like around 2014 15 or so back when i was uh doing comedy in orlando and uh i think when i was uh you know dating marie george that was a time like she actually was the one who got i had seen it you know a little bit but Mm -hmm. the one who got me like real into it so i have to give her credit for that (laughs) uh but i've watched like i've watched the entire thing like multiple times through especially since most of the episodes are like those short adult swim like 11 minute do you prefer the shorter episodes or like the uh, 22 minute episodes? Cause I would notice that they went back to the 11 minute episodes when they did the fourth season. And I wondered like why, or like, I don't know the exact reason why they went. I like the longer ones. Cause you know, they just have a little bit more to develop, but those short ones are also good. Cause they just, they're, they're so punchy, mm-hmm. you know, like, uh, and then there's the special that they did after all the seasons called the doom star requiem. That's like a 45 minute, like kind of musical that sort of wraps everything up a little bit have they ever toured yeah they used to tour like when the show was like still running like up through i I forget what year it ended like 2012 or 13 or something Mm -hmm. uh yeah they used to tour and they still occasionally play like the adult swim festivals and stuff uh i missed them last time they were in la i was really bummed about that but i actually saw brendan small at the movie theater uh during the (laughs) I saw him and Scott Ian from Anthrax at uh, uh, some, like, I think, like the AMC in, in Beverly Hills uh, during the 40th anniversary screening of The Thing. I was oh, wow. uh, very excited about that. I bet that was awesome. Brendan Small was a lot taller than I expected. <laughs> He's kind of towering over Scott Ian. It does say a lot about the power of Adult Swim. The Death Clock is one of the mm-hmm. highest selling death metal bands in history the highest selling of all time <laughs> <laughs> they, they have the record i mean it is i mean he is very talented and it is uh if that is your style of music it is very very well done music but also you know having that uh marketing platform of hey this is adult swim uh came out of nowhere and created uh, they, they basically created a niche uh, market for people that didn't have anything to watch uh, a lot of dude bros coming home from uh, frat parties or, or whatever uh, I know a lot of people in the military that like you know we have we all came up with sleep issues so it's like it's two o'clock in the morning there's nothing on oh, yeah. to, you know I can watch another you know watch another old movie or or you know whatever crap they're putting out or infomercials and then flip over to Ca- Cartoon Network and here's stuff that was made directly for that age group and you know it's i still watch it 30 years later and um still love everything that they put out but it was like that 
having something that specific for that group of people because that the whenever Adult Swim came out, it was the time frame of kids that were now becoming adults, uh, where we saw the end of Saturday Saturday morning cartoons, like they started replacing yeah. it with live action. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, I really loved a lot of the Adult Swim stuff. Aquatine and Hunger Force was another one yes. that I got real into. You know, like I think I've seen just about all of that. And yeah, just so like it was always such weird stuff too. Like it's just so strange. It's like kind of the best thing to watch like at, you know, two or three in the morning. Like you said, like I also have had a, a lot of sleep issues in my life. So, <laughs> yeah. We, we weirdly have cable at this house. We're not paying for cable. We never wanted cable, but we have cable. and. Mm. It's hooked up to like the bedroom TV and there's a TV in the kitchen that they left. It's a very tiny TV. And like we have it tuned in to Cartoon Network all the time because that's the only channel worth watching on cable, really. Like oh, what yeah. else is there? See, I know uh, in the early 90s, they attempted something similar with uh, a show on MTV called Liquid Television. It was a lot of experimental yeah. stuff, uh, a lot of very strange stuff they you know eon flux came from that and they ended up turning mm -hmm. that into a movie and well beavis and butthead uh stemmed from uh liquid television and then th there was just so much weird stuff but they couldn't sell it enough to the people like trying to sell that show to to advertisers and stuff just didn't work out so it disappeared and then whenever they did bring adult swim it was like hey this is finally something for us it was cool. Yeah. Liquid television was awesome. I remember watching that and really loving it. Like back when it was on for like the short, short times. And then like every like once in a while, like uh, I feel like MTV would bring it back for like a weekend or something. It's such like cool, bizarre animation and everything. All right. Well, let's get into like the episode that you picked. Uh, let's just yeah. kind of, we'll just walk through it together. How does it open? Like, where are we in the beginning? So it opens with, uh, it opens, I think like, in the seventies or eighties at like uh, a limo pulls up and Zaz Blammy Mataz gets out to play an arena show in, I think in Texas is where it's set. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like a little, you know, a little short, like uh scene of like them playing the show and stuff. And then their uh, manager, like talking to them saying like, you know, it's like, don't fuck around in Texas. Like they don't take any shit, whatever. <laughs> uh, and then I think, uh, is that when Dr. Roxo spots Dory McLean, who is like uh, mm -hmm. kind of like the inciting mm -hmm. incident for this whole thing, you know? Yeah. Like, this 14-year-old uh, girl that he falls in love with, which is uh, it's pretty fucked up, but also it's pretty, pretty problematic. Yeah. It's very problematic, but also like very uh, true to a lot of those like old especially like 70s and 80s like rock bands. Everybody like um, Ted Nugent. Oh you look God. at all we of them. They all we used to play rock band with the family. Like when we had all of the kids in the house, we would play rock band like competitively. Like we were pretty uh, obsessed with it. And what, oh God, what is the song? The sitting on a park bench song. Aqualung. Aqualung comes on and we just, cause you know, you don't pay attention to the words all the time when you hear music. And as we're singing this song, the first line is sitting on a park bench, watching little girls. And we're like, what is this like what yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah you realize like whoa there are a lot of like weird pedophilia anthems from like yeah uh, like you know your led zeppelins and <laughs> bands like that like uh yeah a lot of 70s and 80s stuff probably like half of the big rock stars from that era like all there's always stories about them like dating 14 15 year old girls like mm -hmm. uh horrifying stuff that's what the <laughs> that's what the crux of this episode is about so I think then it cuts to, I think, Dr. Roxo in jail, right? Like, I think he's in, he's locked up. Being Maybe cuddled it, by his cellmate. Yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, that's uh, right. He was like, being yeah. spooned or something. Yeah, he's like, uh, yeah, he's all like dirty and disheveled, but still mm -hmm. wearing his like, uh, you know, clown suit. And he gets a call and it's uh, it's Toki. And Toki, you know, Toki is like, uh, since like the first season has always loved Dr. Roxo and they're like, uh, Dr. Roxo is always around. The rest of the band hates him and he's usually causing some kind of trouble. 
but Toki has always loved him and Toki, you know, is like uh, talking to him on the phone in jail saying like, you know, comparing him to all these like horrible things like he's like talks about. He's like, you know, you're like a, a, a turn abandoned building that nobody flushed or like a dead bloated dog on the side of the road. Oh, wait. Like, I wrote one of these down because it was my favorite thing. Shit personified. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is. Uh, that is what, yeah, Pickles calls him shit personified. <laughs> But Toki decides that the reason Dr. Roxo has sunk so low is that his, uh, you know, he's not on top anymore. So he decides that he's going to help him reform Zazblam Imitaz and make a comeback. And then I think it cuts to a press conference where uh, Toki is saying, like, he's announcing the comeback. And then the first re- reporter asks him a question. He's like, how are you going to pay for the concert? <laughs> and then we cut to, uh, like, the band meeting where Oftenson is explaining so the band that like uh oh you pay for the concert by using the death clock vacation fund yeah there was a there was a nice little uh callback in in there uh because uh they're upset because they were planning to go to euro disney and asia disney and mm-hmm. disneyland and they skip going to disney world and or in florida because like two episodes earlier with death gov where they destroyed the state of florida Oh yeah, I for I that didn't uh I didn't think of that at the time, but yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, the, the, things are a little different when you sl- when you uh, uh binge watch them and you kind of <laughs> catch a lot lot more patterns and recognition and callbacks and stuff. Oh yeah. I think this show is like really good with details because it's also a double flashback episode and like hour long dramas can't do that as well as this show did. Yeah, like, they really, I thought they like, handled it amazingly. They really do a great job of like nailing the details and coming back like to stuff from like you know one or two seasons before, and it's just like mentioned like quickly in another episode, and they like somehow don't don't forget it and always uh, <laughs> always seem to add it in. I think I really love that because Nathan Explosion being based on Corpse Grinder from Cannibal Corpse, which I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're like one of the biggest bands in death metal. Uh, one of the biggest real bands it's non-fictional <laughs> and they're part of the tampa death metal scene which is like uh, tampa is con- kind of considered the death metal capital of the world i did not know that oh yeah it was like uh in the like late 80s early 90s like uh all the biggest death metal bands aside from like the swedish ones were either formed in and around tampa or relocated from Ta- or to tampa like uh huh. Cannibal Corpse formed in Buffalo, but they moved to Tampa because that's where the whole scene was. And that's where more sound studios where all the death metal bands recorded uh, was, and which is also where I grew up. So I have a special like soft spot for the whole death metal scene for that reason. That is cool. As um, hell. But Corpse Grinder from Cannibal Corpse, the best known death metal band and like has the most violent over the top lyrics. And like a lot of their early stuff with the original singer, it was like very misogynist and violent. And like, it's just uh horrifying stuff but he really loves disney too <laughs> uh, and so he goes with uh, goes with his kids to disney all the time and he's really into war world of warcraft <laughs> like he's kind of just a big nerd but also a giant terrifying man so it's like it's cool because there's so many things that are like taken from real life that they kind of weave into the band so it's like historical fiction yeah a little bit yeah and so, like, Austinson's explaining to them that he used the Death Clock Vacation Fund, and they're always, like, slow and don't, like, they don't get things ever. They're all kind of, like, idiots. This scene is so great. Like, what about our vacation? <laughs> you know? Ask Toki. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> like, your vacation is gone. My uh, favorite thing, my favorite detail about that room that they are in when they're having this conversation is the TV hung from the ceiling by hooks. Yeah, yeah. Everything's, like... uh Everything in Mordhouse is so brutal and like <laughs> everything's like covered in like sharp edges and like it's all all the walls are black. It's all like black and red. Like it's the most like uh, foreboding, intimidating looking place on the planet. <laughs> That's like <laughs> where they live and hang out. <laughs> it's such a great like death metal universe. Like the whole like world they exist in is kind of like almost like a death metal satire of real life. Mm hmm. But yeah, so like uh, they realize that like okay, well if we don't make this concert happen, we're not get, gonna get to get to go on our vacation. So the band decides to take over the project. I think that is when Oftenson decides to book like a press junket to promote the thing. 
Yeah, they they do a montage of because uh, Nathan Explosion brings up the fact that every time that the band has tried to get back together, they've ended up failing and canceling the show. And then they go through that montage of all the reasons why they had to cancel. <laughs> yeah, the, the previous re- re- reunion shows. It makes makes me wonder how many of those ended it. Like, I'm sure they came up with more than they filmed and how many ended up on the cutting room floor. That's like got to be another writer's room. Very fun day. Oh yeah. That has to be. Cause like the ones they came up with are all pretty good. Like, mm-hmm. the first one, like they took a bunch of acid and then it was just spraying this lady in the front with big tits with a big spraying thing. And then he smuggled a bunch of uh, cocaine and his colon, but they ate super spicy Mexican food and the bags melted and like, OD'd and then borrowed money from an Ecuadorian drug cartel. And, didn't want to pay it back so they shot him in the dick and he's, <laughs> he's out the side of his dick now and they, so they go through all that and then they you know they're just giving toki shit say like you know there's something wrong with you for <laughs> for loving this clown so much and he that's when he says like oh no i'm fine and he walks out but then as soon as he walks out he's like screaming having a panic attack because he sees a bicentennial quarter on the <laughs> ground which is such a such a weird thing and that's when i think uh they uh bring in dr twink Leditz. <laughs> who is the band therapist watching we watched it with uh closed captioning on so like my brain read faster than the word than they said the words who so i was expecting them to say twinkle tits but it's yeah. not <laughs> it's definitely spelled twinkle <laughs> yeah. tits yeah uh, that's great and he, he you know he's from an earlier episode of the band <laughs> therapy <laughs> The mispronounced name always tickles me in a special way. Like it's such an easy, stupid joke, but it's always funny to me. Like uh, uh, on Thirty Rock, there's Dave, uh, Doctor Spaceman, uh, <laughs> and his name, and you see his name placard. It's Doctor Spaceman. Oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's great. I, uh, so many fun details like that. But uh, yeah, so I think like uh, this is the point where we go into like uh, like. Dr. Twink Leditz has like Toki and he like has him like doing some like regression therapy, I think. Mm-hmm. And they go into Toki's childhood in Norway. <laughs> and he's just like, yes. He's just like shirtless in the snow, like just doing all these like crazy, like, cra- like crazy, like hard backbreaking labor. <laughs> but he says he is happy. I don't know what the Norwegian version of it is, but it's, it's very close to an Amish lifestyle. Uh, whenever they show his yeah. parents, in, like I know the Christmas episode was, they showed his parents. And then there was a episode from like season one where they brought all the parents in to, to do a thing. And his parents are very staunch Amish. They're almost Amish looking, but they're very yeah. like gray skin and uh, like very, they look like they could be pushed over by a, a, a light breeze, but they're very staunch and strong people. And yeah, was... they're like stone faced and like <laughs> no emotion. Yeah, they're I don't know exactly what they're supposed to be, but yeah, they're kind of like uh yeah, Norwegian like Amish people a little bit. Like they're still living like a super traditional lifestyle. Like and I think there's the one where they where Toki's dad's dying, so they they like the band goes to Norway with him. Yeah. Uh and yeah, it's showed like he lives like on the top of like some fucking mountain, <laughs> like in the middle of which uh really like um I don't know if you've seen any of the the documentaries on the Norwegian black metal scene, like uh there's a uh, one called Until the Light Takes Us, I think. Uh but uh Mayhem is from Norway. They're like the most notorious band of all time. Uh I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, but Lords of Chaos is based on them, that movie uh, okay. where uh, like they formed and they were like super evil and satanic. And the original singer they got killed himself like he, he like he ends up like he shot himself in the head with a shotgun. And then that like photo got used as like a bootleg cover for like one of their live releases. But their guitarist, I think, like, he found the body and, like, he had, like, tried to, like, slash his wrist and then he ended up shooting himself. And he, like, apparently took bits of his skull and, like, tried to, like, mail them out to people and stuff before. So that happened. And then there was another, like, you know, friend of the band who, like, stabbed somebody to death in, like, a hate crime. But ultimately, their bass player uh, was this guy who went by Varg Vikernes, also called himself Count Grishnok. <laughs> who uh 
formed the band Burzum, and he's like a, a neo-Nazi, but he ended up stabbing the guitarist to death. Uh, and what he claimed was an act of self-defense. Like, you know, <laughs> apparently the guitarist told somebody else that he was going to, like, taser him and torture him or something, so he ended up stabbing that guy to death. And I think it was, like, the drummer, like, recruited a new bass player, and they're, like, still going. The band is still active. Jesus. That sounds very close to Dr. Twinkletis's uh backstory. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. And uh oh they they yeah, there was an that was a, that brings up another uh like one of those hidden buried details. Uh at one point uh Dr. Roxo gets in a fight with Zaz blaming Mataz, and the excuse for it was that someone in the band stole his bananas. And then if you go back to uh, the the twink lettuce, uh, the what is it, death uh, death therapy or something like that? Yeah. Doctor Twink Lettuce got the got death clock to get into therapy by giving them a reward of a banana sticker. Yep. And <laughs> oh. so so it kind of points back to death blaming uh, Zaz blaming Matanz actually having therapy with Doctor Twink Lettuce and someone in the band stealing the bananas and stuff so it's just everything kind of interconnects and and goes back and twirls around oh man i never made that connection <laughs> uh that's great i actually went off the tangent but i was gonna say the other norwegian thing is the band gorgoroth their singer this guy gall he lives like he's interviewed and they're super satanic he lives like on the top of a mountain out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> in norway and like somebody somebody came onto his property and like trespassed and he like you know tied the guy up and like beat the shit out of him and stuff and got arrested for that but uh yeah toki's like toki's whole childhood and backstory is all based on those bands and all their really fucked up history so we were like uh, i think in toki's childhood it shows him he's like pushing some giant like wooden thing like it looks like a thing out of like conan the barbarian like, <laughs> yeah I don't know, like some type of big wooden mill like and one of them breaks so he gets sent to the punishment hole which is just like, <laughs> pit deep in the ground that his dad forces him to go into i bet he he forced him to dig it too probably you know like that's kind of like (laughs) seems like the kind of child that he had he's always like he's always like a weird got like an arrested development thing going on where he is sort of like childlike Mm -hmm. uh and little kids love him and stuff but then he's like got this like deep-seated rage that occasionally comes (laughs) out yeah so he's like in the punishment hole and you know, he's like imagining these like giant spider monsters coming at him, but he has this little like weird straw clown doll that's like his friend that has, you know, he says his dad didn't know he had a friend that like protected him. <laughs> so that's like the explanation for why he loves Dr. Roxo. And he's telling it looks this like to, his straw doll. Yeah. He's telling this to Dr. Twink Lettuce, and then it shows the rest of the band is standing behind him while he's telling the story. And Nathan just <laughs> listens to it. It's just like, ugh. Like, <laughs> <laughs> creeped out by the whole thing from there we go to like the sort of press junket that they booked to promote the zaz blammy mataz reunion and it's just like a montage of like dr rock so like on radio shows and doing interviews and one detail i always notice there's like he's on the view but it's called the venom <laughs> <laughs> uh i didn't uh, catch that one. Oh yeah he's like a he's like a basically a, like on the set of a show that's set up exactly like the view but it says the venom <laughs> And everything, like, uh, all the stuff in the show is always based on, like, uh, other, like, death metal bands. Like, there's little, like, references. Like, they go to, like, a, uh, uh, there's a fast food place in it called Dimu Burger, which is based on the band Dimu Borgir. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there's, like, one where they have a driving instructor and his name's Mr. Gojira. Gojira is, like, a French uh, technical death metal band and there's so many of these like like uh little like references to other bands like throughout the whole thing uh you, you keep spouting off like subsets of the death metal genre that i didn't even know existed like you just said technical death metal and uh earlier you called um uh, death lock melodic death metal like how yeah. many other ones are there that i don't know exist oh man there's so like metals subgenres go so <laughs> deep you know You've got, you know, old school death metal, technical death metal, melodic death metal, uh, death grind, death core, uh, <laughs> black and death black. metal. Yeah, Swedish black, uh, or no, we had Norwegian black metal mostly. Yeah, the <laughs> Swedish uh, death metal is like uh, 
Uh, there's got to be some that I'm forgetting. But yeah, it, it, like uh, they go yeah. super deep. There's so like I, I grew up mostly in like the punk scene, like listening to like punk and hardcore and stuff. But like in my 20s, I started to get more and more into metal. And now I've just gotten so deep into it. It's it gets ridiculous. You know, there's like so many they keep like just mixing and creating new subgenres and micro genres and stuff. Like there's national socialist black metal and depressive suicidal black metal. <laughs> and, oh, death and roll, which is like the Swedish death metal band entombed. Like they became more, they, they incorporated more like seventies rock into their style and created like these weird hybrid styles. There's death doom. There's this sounds uh, like a rabbit hole. I might need to like take a trip down. Uh, you can start with the soundtrack from Brutal Legend. It was the um, I remember was, that oh, game. Yeah. The video game from Jack Black that basically goes through the different genres and stuff, uh, trying to yeah. build a world. Yeah, that, that, that was a fun game to watch you play. I played that one in like in the last like couple years. Actually, it was on like Xbox Game Pass, and I downloaded it and played it for a while. This is a bunch of great cameos. Like it's got Lemmy from Motorhead is like yep. a character in it, and like maybe like Dio and King Diamond and like <laughs> all these different. There are Deathlock songs on Guitar Hero, but not Rock Band. Oh really? Yeah. yeah I... And um, they actually ended up making their own game, like a Rock Band style game that is like a Flash game that you can play on your browser. It's very similar with all of the Deathlock songs. So if you ever want to do like an old school rock band guitar hero there's all a death lock one. Oh, that's cool <laughs> i didn't know that I, I only played those games like a little bit i kind of dabbled in them like i played them at friends places and stuff but never got too deep into them so much fun i kind of found them frustrating because i always played guitar and it was like real counterintuitive to play the like the guitar controllers what, compared to playing a real guitar so the I drums really, are even made worse. It really hard like I the like drums I are even worse Oh, yeah. I heard, though, the drums kind of are, like, uh, the closest one to playing, like, the real thing. Like, I had a friend who played drums, and he got started playing rock band drums, and then he transitioned into, like, a real kit. Mickey's son did that. Yeah, he started to put it, like, he would uh, put it on and just play the drum portions of it, and then he went and saved up and bought uh, uh, an electric drum kit so that he could play in his room, and... We'd hear them like all the time. We'd just all hear the, the tapping of the pads. <laughs> oh yeah! <laughs> so it just sounds like someone slapping, cla- you know, slapping silicon uh, pads and stuff. But uh, yeah. what he recorded, and he's like, "Here, this is what I've been doing." And it's like, "Oh wow, this sounds great." Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I've been thinking about getting an electric drum set. I kind of wanted to learn to play. It's like over the pandemic, I started uh, like writing and recording my own music, but Hell the yeah. only. Yeah, yeah you're a member uh, of what four bands now five bands uh just two just okay. two. <laughs> there was gonna be a third one for a while but uh and after one practice i was like it's not for me you know <laughs> my like uh, the music i didn't think was very good so i had to after one practice i was like ah eh, sorry i'm out and then <laughs> it never really went anywhere but uh yeah i've got two now i've got one that's like a heavy like sort of metal band that i'm playing in and then another one that's like more kind of indie garage rock with uh tara's husband david oh shit that's awesome yeah yeah it's two cool. people i love oh yeah yeah it's been fun like uh you know getting to know david better he's right he's like the main songwriter for that project i've been contributing a little bit and then mm-hmm. I, my band botched execution that i've written uh, a handful of songs and we're in the process of recording a demo now so cool it's pretty exciting it really is you, you guys are just like living your best life in LA, like everybody that went there. Yeah, yeah, most of us. We're, you know, we're trying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a fun place, expensive, you know. Yeah. Can be overwhelming, but uh, yeah, we like it. All right, so we were with uh, Toki uh, in the punishment hole <laughs> with oh, the yeah, little whip marks on his back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's getting like whipped and beaten. Oh, yeah. So then we're on like, uh, go from there to like, uh, I think Dr. Roxo's like press junket, uh, where he's like, it's like a montage of him being interviewed. And then we go to the one where he's being, uh, he's on TV interviewed like by some reporter, like based on like, I don't know, like Barbara Walters or like that yeah. type of show. And that's when they decided to do the expose on his uh, relationship with Dory McLean, which was the thing that ultimately led to his demise because he fell in love with a 14-year-old and, and wrote a song about her. 
Yeah, and and I was like, okay, so like I did a deep dive trying to figure out if there was someone specifically in Van Halen that this was about, but uh, Van Halen, uh, clean. They uh, didn't have any arrests. Uh, and then yeah. Ki- and then uh, Kiss, there was someone that they were associated with that was arrested for child porn, but no one in Kiss ever really got in trouble for that. But didn't it did like bring. A- Sorry. Go ahead. Didn't they have like a creepy song though? I thought they were uh, on your list of song creepy songs. Oh yeah, Christine sixteen. Yeah, um, was mm-hmm. one of their creepy songs. But like Ted Nugent had a song that literally is called Jailbait. Then uh, like Police had a song that uh, specifically references that book by Navikov, which was um, oh yeah oh was, uh, Lolita. Lolita Lolita yeah. yeah. Kip Winger wrote six uh, seventeen. She's only 17. Oh. Her daddy says she's old or she, her daddy says she's too young but she's old enough for me. It's like that's uh that's creepy. Yeah, um, yeah so many. <laughs> and then we like we were driving around the other day and uh they uh an old song from Bell Biv DeVoe came on. We were and popping. the like it's one of those things where you're like just paying attention to the rhythm and dancing and stuff and it's like here comes the lyrics and it's like backstage underage uh it's like what wait a yeah. second and the way bill biv devoe got around it is they tried to blame busta rhymes for for writing that lyric they're like we we just sang it we just sang it we didn't mean it we didn't mean it sure sure yeah and you didn't even you were like oh this is fine <laughs> no reason to change this lyric like i also felt like uh, there was a song by the beatles uh where it's like she's just 17 and you know what i mean it's like uh... we do know what you mean we don't like <laughs> Uh, and then um, Rolling Stones had one called uh, Stray Cat Blues. And they talk about uh, a 15-year-old and the 15-year-old bringing her friend over. And it's like, well, Mick Jagger is someone who actually did date a 14-year-old when he was older. And uh, someone else in the band also dated a young young woman when they were in. So like that, my guess is that Rolling Stones story is probably the closest uh closest storyline to what Zaz Blame and Mataz did because it's like you did it and then you wrote a song about it and yeah. you confessed to the world that you did it bragging about doing that it's like oh come on guys yeah there's so many examples and like uh, I think Icky Pop too dated like a 14 or 15 year old Jerry Seinfeld dated a 16 year old <laughs> You know, Dan I don't Cook understand how Jerry Seinfeld now. escapes all of the. He he's a creepy. It's wild. He's a creepy. Yeah. I, I I think so too. I was never a big Seinfeld fan, which you know a lot of. A lot I of loved I know were. <laughs> the supporting cast, but I never liked him. But yeah, I mean, it was it was like so many bands and musicians. I mean, going back to like Jerry Lee Lewis, I think was probably one of the first. Like we were we were just talking about him the other day because there was a movie made about him called Great Balls of Fire, and I watched it so much when I was growing up and I like sat back and thought about it like it was kind of a love story about him and and the little girl and I'm like, why yeah. did I like watching that so much? yeah, and she was also his cousin, I think mm-hmm. too, yeah, yeah, it was like it's wild how like and almost all of them got away with it. it seems yeah. like you know. That's I feel like the difference in this story is that like Dr. Roxo actually got in trouble, like, you know, ruined his life and career over this, where like this was happening with all kinds of rock stars and, you know, I don't know, maybe R. Kelly getting canceled is like the the closest thing that we've seen to that happening. And like, you know, yeah, I guess he did actually get jail time finally. But that was like that was 20 years after the fact. Like he uh, R. Kelly was married to Aaliyah. Mm hmm. And she was 15 and he wrote a song for her to sing saying age is just a number and yeah. had her mm-hmm. sing it on the album that he was producing as a, basically a love letter to himself. Well, he wrote her love letter to him mm-hmm. and basically professing that, oh, she, you know, age is just a number. It's okay. And it's like, this is really creepy. And it's like, they put it out in front of everyone and then 20 years later, he finally got in trouble for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, man, it's wild. Like, it's just like the whole history of popular music is tainted by this, like, <laughs> this legacy of like all these pedophiles being like almost open about it, like half the time. 
I guess going back to the episode, like they say, you know, that's what the reporter says, like, and, and she ends it with saying, and here you sit before us, uh, like a huge piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dr. Roxo is just like shocked by this. And uh, it's funny that they just like cut. And then she's like, all right, and we'll be back with more interview with Dr. Roxo. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where he like, uh, you know, he says like, oh, I can't take it. And he right before the reunion's about to happen, he runs off and uh ends up in like a crack house basically uh full of corpses it's kind of terrifying yeah yeah that's the thing it's like the show's really funny but then it gets like really dark and like almost a little bit scary like Mm -hmm. on a pretty regular basis so like the band like they're you know they're out looking for him because you know they know if like they don't if the show doesn't happen then they're gonna lose their vacation funds so they're (laughs) determined to make it happen so they're searching for dr roxo and he finds the you know, he finds all these corpses and says, like, oh, they must have died from snorting this bag of, like, this bag of obviously <laughs> bad drugs. <laughs> Whatever it is. You know, maybe, like, fentanyl or who knows what it was supposed to be at the time. Uh, and then he goes ahead and snorts it anyway. Because that's, you know. <laughs> that's the addiction. Yeah, yeah. his whole character, his, his catchphrase is, like, I do cocaine. He's just, constantly, <laughs> you know, he's just constantly talking about cocaine. <laughs> Always getting into trouble for it. You know, there's episodes where he tries to go to rehab and get clean and <laughs> never works. So he he snorts it and then he kind of like he ODs and then sort of like trips out and goes on this like crazy, like bad <laughs> trip where he starts seeing like, uh you know, hallucinating all these like this crazy, like multicolored, like clown, like elephant with like zebra stripes that's like <laughs> sucking on its own trunk and like sprays him <laughs> with like black sludge. And then there's like a demonic version of Dr. Roxo that just keeps saying like, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. <laughs> and he sees like a giant demon, Dory McLean, and she like vomits black sludge on him and, and like the demonic dr roxo is like starts like grabs him and starts electrocuting his dick and that's when he like snaps back into consciousness and wakes up and it was a defibrillator like they were using to revive him and bring him back to life you know kind it's of so, in the style it sounds ridiculous to hear it like explained like watching it was one experience but like hearing you explain it is like a completely different experience oh yeah <laughs> i've realized that you know like with uh you know the podcast i'm doing with nick is like where we <laughs> go through and explain like beat by beat the plot of these like horror movies it's like it's like absurd on a whole other level it's great um, uh but yeah that's when dr roxa wakes up they revived him <laughs> <laughs> and another subtle detail or another uh, attention to detail item is the the person that has the defibrillator is kneeling near dr roxa roxo's crotch like, oh, that's yeah. how they that's how they use the defibrillator on his on his dick to wake him up so when he was dreaming that he was getting shocked in the dick it was because he was getting shocked in the dick <laughs> yeah <laughs> so he gets electrocuted a lot you know like in one of the earlier episodes like uh you know he's like around the mort house like fucking up and like doing whatever and like uh oftenson has the clock of tears grab him which are like they're kind of like sort of henchmen slash servants and they have him like chained up in some room and they're like electroshocking him repeatedly. But so they revive him and then they're, you know, they're like, hey, you know, they tell him like we found Dory McLean. Oh, that was another thing. Like they're, before they find him, they're in the helicopter like searching for her. And uh, they're like, yeah, we got to find her. And Pickles is like, uh, you know, if we go and find a 14 year old girl, it will not look good. Like this will be bad. <laughs> doesn't like no it's 20 years later she's an adult <laughs> like, how is she not 14 again like <laughs> so dumb doesn't understand like they make their dumb like accessible it's not like annoying dumb like sometimes people try to make characters be dumb and they're not likable but i i still think that they're likable when they're dumb in this show oh yeah it like, kind of makes them charming <laughs> like mm-hmm. very often behave like dicks <laughs> <laughs> like pickles is probably the nicest one and they all have their moments but uh yeah god they're just all fucking dumb as shit like <laughs> never understand what's going on uh so they they revive dr roxo and they're like hey well, you know we found dory mclean and she wants to see you and come to you she's coming to your show <laughs> it's like she wants to see dr roxo <laughs> They revive him kind of like they did with Nikki Six from Motley Crue when he like I think he OD'd and like died twice and they 
were able to like bring him back with like adrenaline like <laughs> yeah that's uh the basis of uh kickstart my heart the song was about oh, him shit. dying yeah. and mm-hmm. being brought back to life yeah uh, motley crew that's another hole <laughs> 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 snakes and barrels partially based on them but uh yeah so i think they at that point we're uh, at the show at the Zazblam and Taz reunion, and they're like some, mm-hmm. in some big arena, you know, with this like giant, like uh, multi. And it looks like the concert um, is going to happen. Yeah, yeah, it's like they're finally going to pull it off, and uh, and Toki introduces them. You know, he's like, you know, you know, for the first time in however many years, like welcome Zazblam and Taz, and they start playing and they're killing it. You know, mm-hmm. and that's when we hear this. They play the song Dory McLean, which is a song about. Him, uh, yeah because the lyrics is like uh dory mclean she only 14 she's gonna suck it all night she's a sweet sucking queen <laughs> they were really blatant yeah oh yeah just like very like just a crime like lyrics confessing <laughs> to a crime and it's going well and this is the first time that it's notable that like uh death clock has ever been uh they never had anything nice to say about dr roxo <laughs> You know, like that's where like Nathan is like, uh, you know, Toki, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Dr. Roxo is fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that he's like, he's imagining her like as the 14 year old, like mm-hmm. being in the front row and stuff. So it's like, it's this weird insight into Dr. Roxo's brain, kind of. Oh, I, I guess I forgot where uh, Murderface decides to scalp tickets to the show <laughs> earlier on. Yeah, mm-hmm. he wants to make. His uh, he wants to make the money bank and then also make some side money as well, because uh, often, 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 actually, Charles actually points out that scalping tickets to the concert that you're putting on is actually stealing money from yourself, so it's pointless. But yeah. Murderface again, the stupidity comes in. <laughs> he doesn't understand that fact, and he was like, "I'm the best way to make money is to scalp tickets." Yeah. Oh, nice murder face <laughs> voice, by the way. <laughs> Uh yeah yeah he's always like he's always an idiot he's always trying to like he always feel like they're always giving him shit for being the bass player like you know like basically acting like he doesn't matter uh and downplaying his contributions to the band and they actually say in one episode that Swissgar actually records his bass parts for him like <laughs> in the songs <laughs> like mix like <laughs> drown it out of the mix so you can't even hear it mm-hmm. uh, he's always like trying to do some kind of side hustle scam to make money. Oh, and that's when they have that great like uh, uh, training film they show with face bones. <laughs> face <laughs> it's like, bones. It's like they're every time they show like they show like a little training film, and he's it he explains ticket scalping, and then it goes like. Uh, I would watch a whole show just with a face bone show. Oh, it's great! I like, love it. <laughs> it's like such a good like you know corporate like training film too. Like <laughs> I remember when they used to show us those when I worked at Best Buy years ago very similar vibe it was just like these like weird little like corporate propaganda <laughs> for themselves talking about how great the company was and you know they'd be explaining like how it's good that we're actually gonna cut like pay you less and because like, <laughs> it's good for the company <laughs> like so murder face is trying to scout the last couple of tickets and right across the street from the concert is the uh the quarter collectors convention the, or something oh, yeah. like that. The Franklin Mint. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The Franklin yeah. Mint. Yeah, as he's not scalping any tickets, you know, these people are telling him to fuck off, dick face and stuff. <laughs> so like the show's going on, and then we come back and uh, you know, Toki turns the motor murder face and he's like, Hey, did you scalp any tickets? And he's like, Oh yeah, look at all these quarters. <laughs> Of course, there's bicentennial quarters, which sends yeah. Toki into a panic attack, and he ends up freaking out and knocking some shit over, which like knocks over. Who knows? It turns into like this Rube Goldberg machine of destruction, and it is yeah. amazing. Oh yeah, like it just like you know knocks over some bucket of water, which hits electrical wires and <laughs> everything. So it ends with like the audience being set on fire, people like running around in flames, and the show is canceled. <laughs> You know, and then afterwards, they, they're like uh, still standing by like the melted stage, <laughs> the smoldering remains. And uh, Charles is explaining to them, and he's like, Well, you know, like, uh, turns out insurance, the act of God clause, fire protection saved our asses again. <laughs> <laughs> so they got the money back for the for vacation through insurance. So the band's happy. 
Toki at this point is like catatonic. You know, he's just like too many quarters. Yeah, he's in a wheelchair, <laughs> like hooked up to like some kind of, you know, like IV of Xanax or something. <laughs> Just tell you, know, just telling everybody to fuck off, <laughs> and uh, and then Pickles decides like, oh, now is the time that we should uh, we should bring Dory McLean back in to meet Doctor Roxy, <laughs> and then they bring her in, and you know she's like in her fifties now, forties, yeah. fifties, yeah, older, <laughs> like, and he's just you know Doctor Roxo sees her, and his reaction is just like, you're old. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what would you expect? It's been twenty years. <laughs> Yeah, she has like a full conversation with him, uh, and like his only response over and over is like, "You're you're old, <laughs> you're, you're old." He has nothing to say. He's just staring <laughs> at us, and she's like, "Oh, and uh, you know, I was like, I'm married to a lawyer, and oh, by the way, like this is my daughter, Chastity." <laughs> <laughs> and like her, you know, 14 year old daughter standing there, and that <laughs> she's screaming like, "Chastity, let's go!" <laughs> Dr. Roxo sees her and <laughs> all of a He's sudden like, it's like his his brain turns back on. <laughs> like, K -k -k hello. And that's how it ends. Yeah, it clearly it clearly showing that it wasn't about the the actual person. It was yeah. the it was she was fourteen and young and innocent and, and that's kind of what he wanted. And it's like, yep. oh gross. Oh shit, he's a pedophile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For sure. Great character of a horrible, horrible person with yeah, it's hard no to, redeeming qualities. It's hard to explain to people sometimes why I like terrible characters. It's not because they're terrible. It's just because they're so well created. Yeah, it's right. He's like not supposed to be sympathetic, but like mm -hmm. he's also like a, a cokehead clown. <laughs> so it's like it's weird. Like where he's like this am totally amusing character, but also just like a... a a nightmare person yeah like i would <laughs> not want to meet him no no definitely not he's never like uh they never try to really make him sympathetic throughout the entire show like even when like he gets clean and stuff he's still like bad i fucking hate that clown <laughs> yeah that's like <laughs> that's pretty much their attitude toward him throughout the entire series and even like at the end of the doomstar requiem like the sort of musical that wrapped up the whole thing like he saves them <laughs> at the very end <laughs> like that seems perfect. Yeah, like he, he saves the band. Like they're they're about to get like torn apart by these junkies, and he comes <laughs> in with a giant bag of cocaine and saves. Them. <laughs> of course, he saves them with cocaine. I love it. Yeah, one of the most problematic episodes, but also one of the most entertaining. When I do, when we do these episodes, I do like I find weird shit when I do my research. And one of the things that I found that I thought was neat about this show in particular is. At the time the show was made, it was the cheapest show on Cartoon Network because when Brendan Small was developing the show, he looked at the budget for what was the cheapest show on, at, on Adult Swim at the time. It was Tom Goes to the Mayor. Um, so he found out what the budget was for their episode and said that he could do his episodes for $1 less. Oh, wow. <laughs> Every episode of the That's show was incredible. made for $109,000. Damn, that's like uh, it's kind of amazing what they were able to pull off considering it. But yeah, it was like, you know, I feel like he just did so much work himself. Like he, you know, he had to have. He wrote all the songs. He recorded most of it. He programmed the drums. Like you know, uh, he like in the later seasons, I think he brought in like you know a few other musicians to help mm -hmm. out. But initially, it was just him like writing and recording all these songs and like he would just write like a partial song and that's what you'd hear in the episode. And then later he would, uh, they release like the death albums where he'd like write, finish like a full version of the songs and release them kind of incredible. Like that, that was the lowest budgeted show. Mm -hmm. yeah. but it's like, it has like such an epic kind of. Feel yeah. To it. it does not feel like a cheap show. No. And some of the adult swim stuff does, and it's not a bad thing. Some of them mm -hmm. just do. It's fine. One of the things that like Brendan Smalls took great care in is whenever they're playing guitar, like they're, they're cartoons. And most of the time, whenever they just have people wiggling fingers and, and stuff, he made sure that if there was a close up of the hand and there was a note playing that the hands represented what would, you know, your hand position on a guitar would look like. So everything was yeah. extremely accurate mm -hmm. uh, in represent representation of actual playing. 
Yeah, like that is it's like wow, like such a fine detail that like it could have gotten away with totally not doing that. But like, yeah. and it's like not like simple basic guitar playing either. His like, you know, his compositions, like his and his like his lead playing are like pretty you know, he's not like the best in the world, but he's really damn good. Like mm-hmm. he's like a pretty accomplished metal guitarist. He's won awards for it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he has like his own signature. Actually, I, I, I had a couple of notes. Like they, there's a line where like uh, Swissgar says something like he uh, disappears like a a falcon in a snowstorm, <laughs> and then later on, Gibson came out with the uh, the Brendan Small Snow Falcon Flying V. It's like one of his <laughs> several signature guitars. Aww. So yeah, guitars based on like Swissgar and Toki's guitars in the show. There's like the the thunder horse, I think, and the ghost <laughs> horse. Like they're all <laughs> these ridiculous, like over the top names. But uh, yeah, pretty so sweet. The other weird fact that I discovered was Tommy Blacha. I don't know how to say his name, so I'm just mm-hmm. going to say it like that. Um, who was the co-creator with Brendan Small? Also, I don't. This might be way before your time, but he also created the Pimp Bot Five Thousand on Conan O'Brien. And that was my favorite mm-hmm. era of Conan, so that made me really excited. Oh yeah, my brother was real into Conan. Like he watched it a lot, so I would see it occasionally. But I never got too big into like late night in general. So like I watched a bit of Conan, but I don't think I ever saw the Pimp Bot. Um, oh, it's it was a classic. And the other thing that he did before he uh, took place in, or before he created the show with Brendan Small, was he was the creative director of the WWE. And I think that over the top is definitely translated to the show. Like I'm sure, really? like. That experience was perfect. I had no idea that he did that. I knew that he did stand up comedy for a while. Yep. Uh, and I knew he did home movies, but I had no idea that he had involvement in the WWE. Yeah, this is Tommy Blatcha, not oh, Brendan Tommy Small. Blatcha, no, but, yeah. Okay. yeah, Tommy. Oh, that makes sense. Whoever Tommy Blatcha is. Yeah, he, I only know him as the co creator of Metalocalypse. Yeah, that's all I know. He, he did a lot of the voices too. Yeah, but he, um, he wrote for Conan O'Brien, he wrote for one episode of Saturday Night Live when the rock was the host and i i kind of want to know the story of like why only one episode like how, how that came about so i don't know maybe i'll research that more but the fuck the, i think being the creative director for the wwe would be very creatively fulfilling if it wasn't run by shitty people yeah well actually coincidentally vince mcmahon was just forced into retirement over Thank some God. kind of scandal oh, i the specifics but yeah yeah, I think who's running it now? Person. Is his daughter? I think his daughter and Triple H and maybe like ah, that makes other sense. people. Yeah, you know they're definitely going to keep it in the family. Yeah. Um. Yeah this uh this episode is notable. I think it's only one of the only ones that doesn't feature the tribunal. Oh yeah. shit! Yeah, it's like which I just just occurred to me. It was a, like this like weird like assembly of sort of like an Illuminati type like group that of like made up of like. It was like a general and like some politicians and like uh, the Pope ish, yeah, yeah, like, like a, a Pope. bishop or something like that. Yeah, I think he's a yeah bishop or a cardinal maybe. Uh, and then there's like this weird like later this weird Rasputin type figure, <laughs> and this guy who's always addressing them in this like secret like war room that they have. Uh, and then there's uh, yeah, like the names of the special to the the uh, specialists that they bring in to like here's a specialist on uh, uh, third world economies or whatever, and then they have a name for it. I was like, that's definitely a writer's room. Uh, <laughs> let's let's come up with something goofy. Oh yeah, always some like absurd like scientist name. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if I could think of any of the the specific ones, but I can't. I'd have to I'd have to look them up. I also cannot. Yeah. Uh, I feel like Mark uh, Hamill was a voice of. Yes, yeah, he's definitely a voice in the show because I yeah. I wrote a note about that because I don't think that there's anything that he doesn't voice. Yeah, yeah, it's one of his many credits, but I think he <laughs> adds a lot to it too. Like I feel like he's just got to be sitting in a room twenty four seven behind a microphone recording cartoon voices and shit. Yeah, yeah, it definitely seems like he's spent a lot of his life doing that. <laughs> so <laughs> weird thing. Yeah, the list of guests voices uh and guest bands uh basically you know this is a strange little cartoon on a late night show on a a cartoon network and uh the the amount of names that are listed as guests 
completely legitimizes what he did. Like, if anything, uh, Brendan and and uh, Tommy should be extremely proud of that fact. Of you know, um, like John Hamm did a voice. Um, we, we didn't uh, even talk about who played the fourteen year old girl, did we? Or the mom? The fourteen. Oh no! Oh, it was Lorraine was it? Newman. Oh, from who is? Saturday, Saturday Night Live. She was oh. the one of yeah. She was actually one of the founding members of the Groundlings in L.A. Oh, okay. So yeah, she was uh, on the very first season of Saturday Night mm-hmm. Saturday yes. Night Live. Um, like she was one of the Coneheads, or she was in the Conehead movie. I, oh, okay. Thing like that, but um, yeah, like back when Saturday Night Live was just a bunch of uh, goofballs trying to get it started, and they were like, "Well, anyone funny, come on out, and we'll do this show." And uh, then they became the the structure of, of comedy or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Really like, like sketch comedy, like the kind of defining show for that. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of metal musicians too. Like uh corpse grinder from cannibal corpse was like voiced a few different characters. I know he had like Scott Ian, like such a long list of like prominent, like metal musicians, like, uh, you know, Gary Holt from Exodus, uh, some of the guys from like Slayer. And uh, I think he had like Kirk Hammett and from Metallica and like James Hetfield as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, all usually just doing like little bit part characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, Werner Herzog is a significant one, too. Yes. Werner, I didn't get Werner to Herzog. see his episode, but I would love to because he makes me laugh in like anything. I don't know why. He's oh, just, yeah. He's so serious. He's like a he's a narrator, I think, in the fourth season. Oh wow! Like he's like he does like a a voiceover, like kind of introducing a bunch of the different episodes. <laughs> uh, in the I think the final season. Um, what's cool is they're also finally they're working on a, a movie, a feature length movie that would like uh, for the to replace the fifth season never happened, and that's like in production right now. Cool. That'd be great. I mean, you can see there's very much a a um, tone change whenever it went from the second season to third season, which is where they went from the 11 minute episodes to the full 22 uh, mm-hmm. half hour episodes. And like the the first couple of se- uh, like the first season or whatever, like everything feel felt rushed. Like they were trying to cram a lot in. Second season, they kind of discovered their pacing and they were still able to tell the story but not as in depth but then when you get to the third season like they actually came up with like here's the theme of the episode you know a full uh realized theme and and full storyboarding and uh, just kind of getting into like an a story and a b story whereas in the shorter shorter episodes it was just like here's what we're doing straight through we're gonna run that train yeah yeah there's like it doesn't really like have the tangents and subplots and stuff and doesn't have like the full arc kind of it's just kind of like a kind of get in get out quick there's like this weird like a short little story yeah but so i'm I'm looking forward to what the, they can do with a full 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 length feature time frame That's yeah gonna be great yeah it'll be cool it's like the doomstar requiem is pretty cool i don't know if you guys have checked that out yet but it was like a 45 minute long kind of like a musical like they're most of like it a rock is, opera yeah basically yeah and it starts off with some real goofy like traditional musical type songs like all the <laughs> characters like all the characters singing so you're hearing like uh you know pickles and murder face and to- they they all oh, have boy. singing parts and they they really nailed the voices and then it gets into like uh you know toward the end there's like some like kind of like michael jackson inspired songs <laughs> like kind of give you like thriller vibes almost like uh it's pretty great they also go into a little bit of like the band's origin story like they show like toki's uh audition oh nice so they go show like like the young band and there's like this long scene of like where like it's like this montage of like this like a swiss car like just destroying all these people in like guitar battle basically and it's got this song called The Duel, which is like them like doing like this duel like guitar like solo. Thing. It's pretty great. Uh definitely worth checking out. You have forty five minutes to kill. Oh, we absolutely. often do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think we did the thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
right? We did the thing. Did you want oh, to yeah, yeah. you have something else you were gonna say, Mickey? I just wanted to say uh the the only horror podcast. Like I, I for years I've been searching for a, a horror uh movie podcast and 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 never was able to find one. I mean there's nothing out there. So no finally uh you and Nick Pupo uh also when Nick did his episode for us, uh he chose uh Breaking Bad and he also chose Better Call Saul. Oh, sorry. Yeah, he did Better Call Saul, and he chose the episode that didn't feature Saul on it. So you choosing really? the, the, the oh, that's an interesting pattern. Huh. Yeah. So it was neat to that you chose a uh, Death Clock uh, episode that didn't feature Death Clock, which was kind of neat. But uh, I've been listening uh, on uh, to the Only Horror Podcast with Nick and Joe, and your chemistry is absolutely amazing. Yes. Uh, and, you know, my first initial thought was either they have really good chemistry or Nick's uh, a much better actor than I ever thought he was. And <laughs> I I think he's a great actor. Uh, we watched the uh, Halt the and Catch Fire. Uh, we nicknamed it the Poop Show. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the, the, I, you guys are doing great. I, mm-hmm. I love the love the show. It's a fun oh, time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Like that means a lot. Cause this, you know, it's my first time ever doing a podcast, you know, like I've, I've been a guest on a few before, but this is the first one I've ever hosted. And I think it's real chemistry. You know, I think we, we've been friends for a long time, uh, but thank you so much. I really appreciate you saying that. Like it, it means a lot. And I love that you guys are checking it out. And thank you for having me on this, by the way, I was so excited to talk about Metalocalypse cause I, I love it so much. And there's so, so rarely fun. Thank you for sharing it. Oh man, I'm glad you guys liked it. Like, uh, it's yeah, it's like so rewatchable, and like you know the music. Like, you start to like really get into that too. Oh, I have one question that I keep forgetting to ask everybody at the end, and I want to, so I'm going to ask it. Um, do you watch the theme song when you're watching television, or do you skip it? Like, when you're on a binge, if it's something you've watched a million times, do you watch the theme songs? through or are you a skip it kind of person oh i always watch the theme song and i usually try to watch the credits too i do too you know like i feel like that's part of it like that's part of the whole experience mm-hmm. i don't know like, well we will watch the credits from movies and just like read out random names just because yeah. like oh yeah so a lot of times there's really great ones like mm-hmm. yeah names like it's a it's a great way to like i don't know it's a good exercise for my brain to come up with character names Cause now I have like this bank of names in there. Cause we do that so often. And yeah. well, binging, uh, binging Metalocalypse uh, in preparation for this episode or for this edition of our show. Uh, I noticed that early on they started, the theme song was do anything for metal, do anything for metal. And then reading, uh, saying all the, the characters names. And then they changed it somewhere in the second season to do anything for death clock, do anything for death clock. And mm-hmm. then, um, I forget whatever they changed it to something else in the third season. I can't remember whatever it ends up being. Yeah. Yeah. The lyrics from the, the opening theme song are, <laughs> are just so weird too. You know, like, yeah. Pickles uh, is a drummer. Doodly doodly do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, definitely something that's a lot fun. Uh, I will say that it was fun watching with the closed caption on to catch some of the more subtlety, the subtle things. Mm-hmm. However, uh, they didn't do a really good job of uh, putting the closed caption in. Like they, the the pacing for the closed caption was terrible for them. Yeah, not great. Bob. <laughs> oh man, yeah, yeah. I can see that being tough. I feel like I like I like watching some captions because you can get so many more details, but it also can ruin the bits. Like it can ruin yeah. the timing of jokes. I think a little bit. I think my uh, squirrel is headed to the front porch. Uh, <laughs> uh, so where where can uh, everyone find you and uh, your socials? Uh, what are you hosting? What are you putting on? Oh yeah, so um, right now the only place you can find me on social media is on Instagram at uh, it's at degenerated with an underscore following it, and then also you can uh, follow the podcast at the only horror movie podcast. Uh, we're also on TikTok with that, mm-hmm. but we just post clips. Uh, but yeah, on Instagram, the only horror movie podca- podcast and at Degenerated. And eventually when uh, my bands are ready to release stuff, I'll be posting that stuff there so you can find it there as well. Cool. Awesome. Right. It was great to see you, man. Yeah, it was. it was. great to see you guys too. Yeah. Are you guys coming back to LA anytime soon? November, I think. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tight. 
Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing you guys then. I know. So and thank you again for having me on this. This is great. It was, yeah, uh, it was so much fun. fun. All right. I, this is always the awkward part. I never know how to end things. So bye. Yeah. <laughs> See you guys later. All right. Take care. Yeah, you too. Bye. <laughs>